If you have your Bibles open, you turn to Psalm 8, would you? We will take our words of exhortation from there this morning. We fix our minds upon the bread and the wine, and we think to ourselves, well, the Lord has not returned, as we're here. We think upon the bread, and we look introspectively, and we examine ourselves. How do we align with the character of that of our Lord Jesus Christ? We turn our attention to the wine, and we think, well, how are we going to outpour ourselves in service as we serve one another in the coming week? And it's a fitting thing that we, we look backwards on our week that we've just had, we partake of the bread and wine, and we look forward to the week that we're about to walk into. And the amazing thing about uh, the bread and wine is it's like we are standing in front of a mirror. Though we are a body of believers, a family of God, as our brother mentioned in his prayer, there are many of our brothers and sisters who meet in like manner this morning. Is yet when we come to this table, we come as an individual. So that means we don't sit in the pew and say, well, that brother or sister and so and so needs to deal with this. Or that young person needs to get their act together. But this moment that we are about to partake of, we sit and we think, where in my life am I lacking in the characters of Christ? It's an amazing thing because it's a personal thing that goes on in our mind and it'll be unbeknownst to any one of us except our Heavenly Father and that of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this morning we stand in front of a mirror, brothers and sisters, and the key is we are not to see ourselves in that mirror, isn't it? Who are we to see in that mirror? The reflection of Christ. Because God willing, when we stand before the judge of all the earth, we don't want him to see us. We want him to see himself. And so as we come to prepare our minds to look inwardly at ourselves, we're going to look at Psalm 8, which was David. And he's just come from killing this Goliath. You know, the heart stops beating slowly, 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 slowly. And he's able, through the Spirit, to pen these words and to commemorate that which has just been accomplished on behalf of the God of the armies of Israel. If you look down at Psalm 8, you'll notice there's this little superscription, okay? Just the sort of heading, the title. And it says, at least in my Bible, to the chief musician upon Giddeth, a Psalm of David. So right away we know this is penned by David, okay? This is, this is giving a little authorship. Then if you look at the beginning of Psalm 9, you'll read, hopefully, that there's, it reads, to the chief musician upon Muthlaban, Okay? Now, it's a well-known fact that that little subscription to Psalm 8, which begins Psalm 9, actually corresponds to Psalm 8. Okay, so where it says there, to the chief musician upon Muth Laban, it means to the death of the champion. Okay? So it's almost like there's little bookends. You know, Psalm of David, then Psalm 8, to the death of the champion. There's little bookends on either side of Psalm 8. And that's really what David is going to speak to in Psalm 8. It's the death of King Sin. And so it's a very fitting psalm that we look at this morning as we come to examine ourselves and how we are doing with our battle with our own King Sin in our lives. I think sometimes it's helpful to have a breakdown of the psalm, and I'm going to break it down in two ways, okay? We are taking note. Verses 1 to 4 is God's plan of creation. This is what David is going to uh, speak to in verses 1 to 4, God's plan of creation. And in, in the final verses, verses 5 to 9, God, David is going to speak of God's plan with creation. So verses 1 to 4, God has created, and verses 5 to 9, God is going to tell us what he's going to do with his creation. And so David is not just echoing the sentiments of that great battle there are in here, but he is casting his mind to ultimately the whole earth being filled with the glory of God. And here's how he begins the psalm in verse 1. He says, O Lord, 
Our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Remember, I, I did some work for a farmer uh, back in Canada. And just I would go back into his backwoods, trim up his trees. I would fell some of the dead trees so that the other healthy ones could grow. And he had this saying. He said, you better do a good job or your name will be mud. And he was quite a, a, a fun, sort of jovial sort of individual. And he was of a generation, two generations before me. He's an older man. But to him, your name meant something. Right? So that individual, they're a Johnson. And Johnson stand for something. Or they're a, I was going to say Smith, but I know there's a Smith here. They're a, a, a Jackson. There's no Jacksons, I hope. They stand for something, right? You, we all have a last name, right? And particularly to the young people here, you share that last name of your father, your mother, your parents, your grandparents, perhaps, if they're still alive. And your actions are a reflection on that name which you bear. So you go around and you are a Jackson, for example. How are you upholding that name? Because your actions in life are a reflection of your parents. And for us older, perhaps maybe our parents have passed on, fallen asleep in the Lord. We have a name to uphold, to pass that down to the next generation. So it works both ways. But you see, David opens up with, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now Goliath, his name means to carry into exile. That's what King Sin wants to do. He wants to take us, grab us, and carry us into exile where we ultimately be destroyed. That's what Goliath's name means, to carry into exile. But then God sent David, whose name means beloved. God sent this man, who is beloved, into the arena to tackle this issue of Goliath. And it's no different. The Lord Jesus Christ, his name means salvation is of Yahweh. To remind us that salvation was provided by God in the character and the embodiment of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we think, David starts this psalm with, O Yahweh, our Adonai. So immediately we're thinking of Yahweh, he who will be. And that's us. This is how God is going to be manifested in this earth, in a multitude of individuals. So as we come to partake of the bread and wine, we have to assess, are we aiming towards that goal or have we veered off course? And David continues in verse 1. He says, Who has set thy glory above the heavens? You know, above the heavens that all might see. You know, man is without excuse. If you just go out into the, the night sky and you, and you look at the innumerable star, the host of heaven, you think, wow, how did that all get there? And the purpose is that God is trying to draw in individuals upon this earth to look at that creation and to seek after him, if happily they might find him. So David just talks about this heavens. And then in verse 2, and we have some here today, David says, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. For because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. And David turns his attention to insignificant, helpless babes and young children. It's just like David. You know, an 18-year-old man, nothing special about him. But God used a seemingly insignificant individual to accomplish a great feat and a victory for Israel. And his enemy was Goliath, and he overcame that. I want you to come with me to Matthew chapter 21. Okay, that was the case with David. Well, how about the greater David, which was the Lord Jesus Christ? So we turn our Bibles to Matthew 21. Lord Jesus Christ, too, oh, he had an enemy which he had to overcome. This is in Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. Lord Jesus Christ, days before the crucifixion, 
rushes into the temple, and it says in verse 13, he says, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And then the eyes of the religious leaders, looking at envy, it says in verse 15 of Matthew 21, that the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that Jesus did, and the children crying in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Oh, they were sore displeased. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, well, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? So just cast your mind back to the events of 1 Samuel 17. The key issue for everyone was what they saw, right? They couldn't get over what they were seeing. Constantly, people were seeing, seeing, seeing. And the second thing is that they, were, they couldn't get over what they were hearing. Goliath's taunt was paralyzing them. So seeing and hearing. But did you notice what Jesus said in verse 16? I'm just waiting until then. It's good to know there are police in this area. But in verse 16, the Lord Jesus Christ says to them, Have you never read that seeing... That out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. That's hearing. So what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying is, look, this is his enemy. You have an issue with seeing. You have not read. You have an issue with hearing. You will not hear. Okay? It's just like David's battle. Behind him was Israel. And what they saw and what they heard paralyzed them. They were immovable. They would not go out and tackle King Sin. And the same thing was with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was trying to... Get it out of these scribes and Pharisees that they had to actually do something about it. They had to overlook what they were seeing, overlook what they were hearing, and actually filter their minds with the Spirit. But of course they didn't. So when we come back to Psalm 8, as David moves through this psalm, this commemorative psalm, this is the same idea of what he is commemorating. You see, in verse 2, David has spoken about out of the mouth, the mouth of babes and sucklings. So these are things which are heard. But look what he says in verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained. Now these are things seen. And what David is telling us is that his ears were in tune and his eyes were clear, okay? He did not have that problem. He didn't look around him and, and see the flesh and, and insurmountable odds. And he didn't hear what the world is telling us and succumb to it. He was able to overlook those things and have his senses spiritually in tune with the Spirit. And it's the same thing with us. Don't look around this world. Don't hear what it has to offer because we know this, brothers and sisters. Today it's here and God willing, tomorrow it's gone. Now, did you notice in verse 3 what's missing? Okay? David says, The work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained. What's missing? The sun. So this is telling us this is at night time. David is, is sitting, sitting there through the Spirit. He is commemorating this, and he's looking up. We know David is looking up at the moon, the stars. It's nighttime, tranquil, peaceful. If you've ever had the opportunity to go to Manitoulin Island or a place that's you know, sort of secluded from the, the light pollution, is you, you gaze up there on a beautiful night and you just, you're, you're in awe of the incredible majesty of our Heavenly Father. And here's how our Heavenly Father cares for His creation. In verse 3, David says, When I consider thy heavens the work of thy fingers... It, you know, God just didn't just take stars and go poof, and just throw them. He placed them with his fingers, with precision. It's like David, you know, he reached into his bag with his fingers, takes that smooth stone, opens the sling with his fingers, puts it in there, wraps the sling around his fingers, 
And with his fingers, he lets go. It's precision, brothers and sisters. You think in our own lives, where has God taken precision to line up this event or that conversation? You think back in your own lives, and God is using his fingers with precision and just care. And as we take the bread and the wine in our fingers, we'll think we are to do the same thing. We're to go forward in our steps and carefully choose to obey the commandments of God. Don't just do it haphazardly. And because of all this, David has led to the question in verse 4, which I'm sure many of us have asked. David says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Even the son of man that thou visitest him. David says, what is man? And the word there, man, in the Hebrew is this word enosh. And the word enosh means a weak, mortal man. Okay? And you sit there and you think, okay, who are we? Christadelphians. We're really nobody. There's, you know, a few ten thousands of us in the world. You think, what is man that, that God is mindful of us? That God would actually care about us? But you see, it's because that we are God's creation. And David says in verse 4, but it's the son of man that thou hast visited him. It's the ben Adama. That God has brought Jesus Christ into this world that we all might have a hope in God's kingdom. And David is just sitting there, like you and I, brothers and sisters. You sit there on a night, perhaps, you have a conversation with brother and sister, or there you're just sort of in your room meditating. You have a quiet moment. You think, in all this around us, God cares about us. God visits lowly man. And even in our our darkest days, when you think, oh, I have messed things up. Where am I going? I have no direction. My life is in turmoil. And God cares about me? And you read things like this, and these are the things that were going through David's mind too. But David moves on, and he, I want you to come with me to Genesis chapter 1, Okay. This is how much God cares for us. Genesis chapter 1. There are two domains which God ordained in his creation. Okay. Genesis 1 and verse 17. God has uh, just made the sun, the moon, stars. And he says in Genesis 1 and verse 17, God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So God has ordained these these celestial beings to actually have dominion over the heavens. Now, when you look at Genesis 1 in verse 26... Here's where we are right now, okay? Verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them and God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful, Multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. And so we right now, brothers and sisters, we right now are asked to subdue fleshly thinking. Okay? We're asked to subdue fleshly thinking. And when we come back to Psalm 8, you notice what David says. David knew that left unto ourselves we would never ultimately be able to subdue fleshly thinking in its perfection, okay? 
So David knew that someone would have to come in the future that would actually attain that dominion. Just like he had stepped out in the crowd to fight Goliath, someone would have to come. And here's what he says in verse 5 of Psalm 8. He says, For thou, Lord, hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and with honor. So what David is saying is there's going to be a flesh and blood man, which is going to come lower than the angels, and he is going to attain that dominion. He is going to ultimately kill King Sin. And God is then going to place a crown on that man's head and give him glory and honor. Okay? Now for David, that didn't happen for a thousand more years. Jesus didn't step out into the crowd, out of the crowd, and step before John the Baptist and said, Thus will fulfill us to fulfill all righteousness and baptize him. And then he goes three and a half year ministry. That didn't happen for another thousand years. But in the mind of David, this is what he anticipated. That he would be made a little lower than the angels. And he says in verse 6 of Psalm 8, that thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. And thou hast put all things under his feet. You see, this is David. David David did works of his hands, the sling, steps on Goliath, cuts off his head. But David says, oh, yeah, I did that, but there's going to be one that's going to come that's greater, and he's going to fight the battle for all of us. Now, come with me to Hebrews 2, because the Apostle Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, he picks up on this with one exception in Hebrews 2. You see, as David stepped out, people doubted what they saw. They heard the words of Goliath. They were paralyzed at what they heard. But look what the Apostle Paul says in Hebrews chapter 2. And he's alluding back here to Psalm 8. He says in verse 6, Paul says, But one, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, in a cert, or David, in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the Son of Man, that thou visitedest him. For thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thine hands. You see, Paul is now writing to the, the believers in Jerusalem. Cast your mind back to David. That Lord Jesus Christ, whom you once served, is him. Do not fall back and serve the law yet again. And so, and so Paul is contrasting here the angels and the Lord Jesus Christ. But then Paul says in verse 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under Christ's feet. For in that God hath put all in subjection under Christ, God left nothing that is not put under Christ. But now we see not yet all things put under him. And here's where Paul inserts the one distinction in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. You know, imagine, brothers and sisters, you're born into the world, you grow up, you're nurtured by your parents, etc., and then one day when you're old enough, your parents come to you and they say, you were born to actually be killed. You see, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ, that morning by morning, Isaiah 50 verse 4 says that he was awoken by the word of God. And morning by morning, it would preparatory work ultimately to go to the cross. And Paul says in verse 9 that Jesus couldn't have been an angel. He had to be flesh and blood, a man, because an angel can't die, but a man can. So in verse 9, he says that Jesus, we see him, who is made lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. And that's you and I, brothers and sisters, right now, today. We have to crucify the flesh. 
We have to suffer death, symbolically speaking. But if we do that, you see what Paul says in verse 9. That for the suffering of death, Christ was crowned with glory and honor. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. If we can crucify the flesh today in the days of which we have before the Lord returns, that when we stand before Christ, he will take a crown and he will put it on our heads. It's kind of an ironic thing, really, when you think about it. We're asked to actually crucify King, King Sin, cut off the head. But then in the kingdom, Christ is going to put a crown on our head. But you see, if we don't do this now, then Christ will not bestow a crown on that very head. And so that's the challenge that's left up to us. So come back with me to Psalm 8. So David is looking forward to this individual, this, this Messiah who had come. And he says at the end of verse 6 in Psalm 8, that God has put all things under his feet. In verse 7 he says, All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. So you think, sheep, oxen, that's land, beasts of the field, that's land, fowl of the air, that's air, and fish of the sea, that's sea. So you think about it, brothers and sisters, from the air to the land to the sea, in everything in that realm, Christ is going to have complete dominion over all fleshly thinking when he comes. And then David says in verse 9, something that's not true today. He says in verse 9, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. That's not true today, brothers and sisters. You know, we go about our daily lives, the job, school, home life, whatever the case might be. If you see the news, you see the newspaper, you see the entertainment of this world. And you think, okay, David said, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. All the earth. And it's not true today. And so we have a decision. Do we want today or do we want tomorrow? Do we want to be in that time when it truly can be said that God's name is praised and is excellent in all the earth? And that, of course, is what we are striving for. We want that day. Now, just come with me to Revelation chapter 4. We look at David. Now, he commemorated his battle with Armageddon or sorry, with Goliath, pardon me, and it pointed forward to the time when the Lord Jesus Christ would ultimately in his own life crucify King Sin. He spoke of a great crown, that if we cut off the flesh now, that Christ will bestow upon us a crown of life. But have you ever thought of this in Revelation 4? It says in verse 4 of Revelation 4, And round about the throne... Four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. It was a good thing to do, brothers and sisters, and I'm sure you do this from time to time. You, You envision yourself in God's kingdom. You think, I don't have to struggle with the flesh anymore. I'm there with my brothers and sisters. Christ is in the earth. We get to meet Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. And then we picture ourselves with this crown on our head. We see what it says in verse 10. This is representative of us, brothers and sisters. But it says in verse 10, <laughs> Christ is going to put a crown on our head. But look what we get to do with that crown in verse 10. The four and twenty elders fell down before Christ that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne. So you see, brothers and sisters, here's the the picture. 
will stand before the judge. He will see himself, God willing. We will be reminded day after day, and even particularly this day, of the great sacrifice that's been accomplished. Christ puts the crown on our head. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. And we come into God's kingdom. But then we take that crown and we put it at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll be so happy to do that. And once we've done that, we'll say the words of verse 11. God willing, together we'll say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Brothers and sisters, we're going to say that, God willing, in the kingdom. You can go home and you can practice those words so that when we're in the kingdom, we know them off by heart. But now as we turn our attention to the bread and wine, brothers and sisters, we have to perhaps leave this weekend with this one question. What's the Goliath in our lives? We all have a Goliath. We all know what gets us. We all know what paralyzes us to do the right thing. You see, rather than waiting for someone else to step out of the crowd, say, I hope someone comes. The story of David and Goliath is encouraging us to take the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, David, and say, I'm going to fight that Goliath. Because I want to stand there with that head of King Sin in my hand. Now, when I'm in the kingdom, Christ will put a crown on my head. And in thankfulness of spirit, I'll give it back to him. I tell you, brothers and sisters, if we don't fight Goliath today, then we will not be able to say with David, a commemorative psalm, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to the death of the champion.